I've worked for 25 years in the Toronto area as a general oncologist and just recently come back to Ottawa now with an academic focus on, on several disease sites. But you know, this whole area of biologics and the, uh, what they offer to us in oncology is really breathtaking. My first experience working at the NRC in Ottawa doing molecular genetics when I was 18 years old. And to see how far we've come now, to see the revolution it's brought us is really amazing. So oncologists, I think, are really excited about new things happening. We're excited about cost savings with biosimilars, but we're also a little bit cautious and a bit gun-shy of rapid adoption because we've seen how much they've revolutionized our field. One in the four of us in this room probably will die of cancer. Biologics now have become a mainstay of therapy in all of the common cancers. In breast cancer, we have people with metastatic stage four disease getting trastuzumab, zero evidence of cancer 10 or 12 years later. Melanoma now, probably the worst cancer. We have biologics now that are achieving cures in 25 to 40% of people, only available in the last couple of years. So this is an area where I think we're excited about the opportunities. You know, we are very evidence-based. We're used to having a lot of controls over costs because we've always had expensive new toys to deal with since about 91. Uh, but we do have the concerns. So uh, the concerns I think we have, one, is there's a, lot of, there's a lack of awareness in the oncology community about what exactly a biosimilar is. How is it different from a generic? So I like the Scottish model that was proposed about really building in education for frontline pharmacists and staff about what these drugs are. There is still the uncertainty and discomfort, and I think the point was made earlier in terms of the endpoints for the clinical trials too. For example, the equivalence margins. We're accepting now equivalence as a definition for adopting biosimilars, and equivalence may imply that the drug is 15% less effective or up to 20% more effective. So, you know, when we meet at the water cooler, I think many of us will think maybe in a palliative setting those are worthwhile for the tremendous opportunity and cost savings they offer. But remember, our drugs are used a lot in the cure of lymphoma, in the adjuvant curative therapy of breast cancer. And maybe there's a different level of comfort in adopting these drugs unless we have, you know, two to five year data from other jurisdictions about the actual disease-free survival, long-term cure rates uh, in order to feel more comfortable. That's a very different issue, I think, facing, you know, a disease that threatens life and limb when we're dealing with a curative versus a palliative circumstance. Um, the whole issue of extrapolation, I think, was brought up a little bit in terms of how drugs are approved in one disease and then used in another because of cost savings. This is a big issue in oncology. We have the drugs that are used, for example, both in breast cancer and stomach cancer. The relative contribution of ADCC, the immune mechanism of how they work, is different from one cancer to a different cancer. Can we assume that if it works the same in breast, like trastuzumab, we can use it in stomach cancer? And perhaps more importantly to the oncologist, you know, within a disease, do we feel comfortable again extrapolating that if it's used in metastatic disease with palliative intent, we can automatically assume we can use a biosimilar in the adjuvant curative setting. The issue comes up of monitoring. So, you know, pharmacovigilance is a big deal. We all have EMRs that track all of our dosing. Uh, they all just list drugs by name. We don't have the mechanisms now in our infrastructure to document these four-letter suffixes that go with these, you know, biosimilars to carefully track them properly. And we've been burnt. You know, those of us who have been around long enough remember how there was a reformulation of erythropoietin, a red blood cell boosting um, biologic. And the reformulation led to increased allergenicity and there were deaths from uh, zero hemoglobin, from the lack of the body's ability to produce blood because of side effects like that. So we're very concerned about the long-term efficacy. Our, our diseases are a little bit different than the chronic ones you've mentioned uh, in many respects. You know, they're threatening life and limb. They require decisions and funding and access immediately. Um, and they're not often given forever. They're often given for a relatively short time, six cycles, eight cycles, maybe 12 in the whole person's lifetime. And we only have one opportunity to, to get it correct. And I guess lastly, oncologists have a big concern about will we have any say in the matter? I've been to forums in Europe where we have GI docs, rheumatologists, and the oncologists from Harvard, from you know, previous directors of the European Society of Medical Oncology, they feel the decisions will be made by funding bodies without really any real input from the clinicians or pharmacists in the field. We really want to make sure we have some voice to be able to contribute uh, during the process. But with that, uh, thank you very much. Good. Uh, so first of all, I think it's uh, really great that we have um, some, some folks from uh, other parts of our world 
uh, to come and, and share experience, like Laura and, and others. And I think that's one of the things that for Canada, our, our adoption and, and timing of, of biosimilars is quite different, but we need to sort of learn from others. And biosimilars are very interesting. It is a disruptive technology that you wouldn't think would be disruptive because it should be generally the same. But I see it really as an opportunity. And to pick up on Laura's things um, and, and her framing is we're, we're seeing the opportunity from doing more with the same or doing more with possibly less. And I think from a public payer perspective, uh, we were constantly challenged with that in, in trying to optimize how drugs and resources are used as stewards of overall healthcare uh, resources. And I think we all have that responsibility. Um, so a few points is one is I think uh, one, one perspective that is missing from this panel and, and table that hasn't been spoken is the Health Canada's role and in how the determination of the uh, minimally, uh, no minimal clinically difference and the rigor that goes into the development of a biosimilar and, the, and that is, is very important. And I think we, because of the missing perspective and really the lack of understanding, I think that is something that we need to, to better understand. Um, but as, as we're trying to adopt um, biosimilars, um, we, we do need to consider how all of these are actually integrating into our system. Um, the the uh, health, uh, besides Health Canada, we have the CADIF uh, drug review role, um, and we haven't seen the uh, biosimilars yet for, for oncology, but that going through the, the peak, order, peak order process. Um, but it's interesting to, to hear around um, the Scottish Medicines Co um, Consortium that they no longer review, um, and I think that's something that we'll, we'll certainly need to uh, reflect on. Uh, the other part, um, as payers, that we're very involved with as provincial players is the Pan-Canadian Pharmaceutical Alliance, where we are trying to um, negotiate better value for the biosimilars. At the same time, we're faced with um, probably right now 35 plus drugs that are under review or act actually uh, under negotiation. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but many of those drugs are also innov innovator biologic products. Uh, some of them are no longer biologic in the true sense. They are oral therapies that are treating the same conditions but are, are not um, manufactured through bio biologic systems. So we do need to try to balance uh, all the pushes and demands. Um, for that, we certainly uh, do appreciate and um, understand the need to engage with the clinicians and patients and, and industry on this. And um, our PCPA group um, has certainly reached out to um, industry and we are needing to reach out to more folks to really understand the perspectives. I think one of the things that has come clear to us is that there needs to be um, really the, some people are phrasing a shared gains or the other perspectives, really seeing the value and opportunity of biosimilars and what that can can mean. In, in some cases, it could mean expanding coverage of an existing drug where we have restrictions around it. Uh, the other could be um, expanding to new drugs that we're not currently covering. Um, but some of the points that, um, um, uh, Tom, you raised around other parts of our health system which are not funded publicly but are funded by industry, that's something we, we definitely need to understand a bit more because I think as we were integrating some of our new, new biosimilars, and we've only done two so far, um, um, there, there's sort of two or three still under review, but just with that experience, we had learned a lot that we didn't know uh, previously around uh, how, how uh, different parts of our health system are being affected by biosimilars. Um, in terms of monitoring, another really um, important thing that, again, uh, public payers are not as involved with and it is nice to see that um, in each jurisdiction there are sort of small groups and we've had some early interaction also with our local clinicians in British Columbia to also express that, that desire. Uh, but I do also want to challenge in terms of as, as you're switching uh, medicines, uh, in general you, are, you have the patient in front of you in, in terms of ability to monitor, but I think it's having that Canadian data and that, that sort of comfort around an aggregate approach uh, and whether that is um, really needed to, and to what extent, if it is. So those are sort of some of my, th uh, my thoughts here. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, um, Eric. Um, 
So our next uh, speaker is going to be um, Dawn Richards. Dawn is Vice President of the Canadian Arthritis Patients Alliance. Dawn, um, we need a patient perspective, please, because uh, we've had a lot of others up to now. Hi, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. And um, over the past, I guess, few months, there's uh, been quite a collection of different stakeholders getting together to talk about some of these issues. So I'm pleased to see we continue to move forward. I hope we can move some of the conversation into actually rolling up our sleeves and doing something together. So I do live with rheumatoid arthritis. I am a representative from a, from a patient organization. I realize I don't represent all patient perspectives. But I think one thing that I want to circle back to is that this discussion for patients becomes very highly charged. It becomes something that we feel like is out of our control. When you live with a chronic illness, most of what you live with is outside of your own control. And really, where you want to be is just a productive person in society. So I just want to bring that perspective briefly so that you can think about that. We hear a lot, especially in arthritis, about how much we cost the system, whether that's medications, whether um, it's the healthcare system itself. And we don't hear a lot about how us doing well and being productive members of society you know, um, helps us contribute back to that system. So that's another point that I wanted to bring. I was really glad to hear from Laura that um, patients, public members have been part of their consultations. And we've, start, we've seen that in Canada to date, and I guess I'd just like to highlight that we continue to do that because I think as a collective, we can do a lot more than just as groups in, in our own little silos. Um, I guess I, I took the assignment more to heart, and I did focus a little bit more on the NHS Scotland paper, but uh, you know, I think there were some really sound principles there, and I guess the one thing that I sort of missed, though, is really that shared decision-making perspective. I think that the conversation between uh, patient and prescriber is really key, and I think that it should be highlighted in whatever we do here. Um, different people are going to choose different things. You know, we might all sit here and say, well, no patient's ever going to choose to switch, but you know what? I, I can't tell you that, right? So I think that that dialogue is a really important one. And I, I did like as well seeing different approaches based on different specialties because our diseases aren't the same. They may be related, but they're not going to be the same. And so I really like that um, there's this focus on bringing different perspectives into that. I think in terms of monitoring, We've had a lot of discussion about monitoring and, and you know, and being in rheumatology, I know there's all kinds of great cohorts across the country that can capture a lot of this. Um, I'm not sure that's the case in other disease areas. And um, being part of a few of these sessions now, there's been a lot of swirl about, you know, what's realistic, who's doing what, who feels like they're capturing adverse events. And I don't want to I don't want to see us play the blame game. I just want to have an open dialogue about who's going to do what and how we can leverage resources that we already have to move forward. Um, so, and I think the other thing here is that those of us in the room, I think, are fairly knowledgeable about this space already. And there's a, a lot of talk about both prescriber confidence and patient confidence. I really think in the patient world, we're just starting to make a ripple as to what I'll say the average patient understands about these medications. And so I think that we need to take them into account as well. We need some of those, I'll say average patients, that's not the words that I'm looking for, but those who don't represent patient organizations aren't part of the health charities, and we need to know what's going through their mind as we continue to, to move the, the needle ahead too. So I guess, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist here. I see biosimilars as an opportunity. I just want us to be cautious and be smart and consider a lot of different perspectives as we move it forward. So thank you. That's great. Thanks very much, Dawn. And now we're going to move on to hear from the people who bring these things to market and uh, give us the opportunity to have these discussions and for patients to be treated at all. 
Um, so firstly, we're going to hear from uh, Frédéric Lavoie, Vice President of Access and Government Relations in Pfizer. So Frédéric. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to IEG for organizing and congratulations to my co-panelists who have all done very interesting remarks. Um, so uh, I work for Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer is an innovative uh, pharmaceutical company and uh, we bring uh, innovations in a vast array of therapeutic area oncology. Uh, we bring vaccines, we bring uh, uh, smoking cessation products uh, really uh, in many, many different therapeutic areas. Um, and uh, our goal is really to make sure that we bring those innovations to add years to patient lives and lives to patient years. Nice, huh? <laughs> uh, but to be able to continue to bring those innovations to market, like we are also very conscious and concerned about the sustainability of the environment to see these innovations being accepted and integrated in, the, in, in, uh, in patients' lives. So uh, from that perspective, bringing biosimilars on the market as Pfizer, because we brought uh, uh, Inflectra, which is Infleximab, uh, was a great opportunity of creating, creating that space uh, and, uh, and see uh, opportunity for more uh, investments to be made in uh, innovative pharmaceutical products. So um, I would like to anchor my comments on two principles. The first one is that um, I think we, we are uh, interested in seeing a healthy, balanced coexistence of biosimilars and original uh, biologics in the marketplace. And we're also interested to see uh, appropriate, as a second principle, appropriate adoption mechanisms for those biosimilars. And I think with what we've heard from Laura, I think there is healthy practices that we can learn from in order to build those principles into our Canadian system. So the reason why I'm talking about those two, two principles um, is supported by some data. I'll give you some facts. Hopefully that will make you reflect. Uh, so Inflectra uh, has been uh, in the marketplace for three years now. It was approved originally in 2014 after a rigorous um, a review uh, by Health Canada for its quality, its safety, and its effect efficacy. Um, so uh, in, originally it was approved in rheumatoid arthritis indications as well as dermatologic inter indications, and a year ago it was approved in uh, IBD uh, indications as well. So now it's got a full array of indications it's approved for. Uh, as Pfizer, uh, before that, Ospira, we went through the process that was shortly described in Canada. So after Health Canada review and approval, we went through health technology assessment uh, with our files. We went through uh, Pan-Canadian Farm School Alliance negotiations. We went to contracting with the different provincial programs. We worked with private payers to ensure these, this product was accessible, and it's actually, and we went through INAIS as well in Quebec. Uh, and we, are, we have a situation where the product is widely reimbursed for naive patients across Canada, across all indications. Three years later, so today, we have a product called Inflectra uh, that coexists with Remicade, and for every $100 that gets spent uh, on infliximab, there is $99.54 that goes to Remicade, and there's 46 cents that goes to Inflectra. So from that perspective, I think this is far from being a balanced marketplace where both coexist. Uh, and although we have naive uh, recognition, and I think, I think again, we're, we're very um, much in favor from multi-stakeholder approaches, discussions with patients, clinicians, specialists. Like we also got it very clear from the conversations that we had up to now that uh, in each of these therapeutic area, there is absolutely a need to reflect on an approach that is disease specific, that is, that is specialty specific, and that makes total sense. Uh, however, I would argue that uh, we need to incept those appropriate adoption mechanisms to get in a place where there will be sustainability for biosimilars because with that type of information I just shared with you, I would argue that uh, the signals and the incentives for a private sector company like Pfizer to bring those biosimilars to the marketplace uh, are not extremely uh, positive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederic. 
And finally, last but not least, um, a second industry perspective uh, from Julia Brown. Julia is Vice President, Government Affairs and Market Access in Janssen. Thank you very much, Chris. And thanks, everybody, and to my fellow panelists for the great comments. Uh, I am from Janssen, and we are the makers of Remicade. So yes, there's some inherent bias there. Um, I, we're also part of the Canadian Originator Biologics Coalition, uh, a group of um, biologics manufacturers who also, very much uh, to Fred's point, believe in a healthy and balanced environment for both Originator Biologics and biosimilars. And I think are very um, attached to the idea that that can be achieved in a competitive marketplace, which is what we've already seen uh, in the environment with, the, with all of the originator biologics in the first place, that if you allow that competition to manifest itself, good things happen, and the value that goes beyond the treatments themselves emerge and contribute significantly to the patient outcomes uh, that we see in the marketplace. And I think that's incredibly important to, to note, and specifically when Health Canada has acknowledged that these products are not, in fact, interchangeable. So they very much come to market as as a competitor product in the marketplace, not interchangeable with the existing products, um, and with every opportunity to, uh, to compete effectively in that marketplace. And so how we get there, I think, is going to be really important, and a few concerns that we have about that, uh, for sure. And, and Fred pointed out the small market share that, um, that Inflectra has right now uh, versus Remicade. As, as some, uh, some, first of all, difficult cases make bad law, and I think it's, it's rather uh, concerning that Remicade and, and infliximab, in fact, was the first case study because I don't think it's the best one to build a framework around because it is an IV-infused drug. It requires a lot of supports. Um, that is something that has evolved over time and has, again, contributed considerably to the outcomes that we see uh, in patients. Um, I don't think that a payer manipulation of the marketplace is the right way to go. We do need a made in Canada model, I will add that to the, to the picture. I think we can learn from other jurisdictions. We have a very unique environment that requires a unique solution. Um, I don't think that a payer manipulated uh, evolution of the marketplace is going to get us where we need to go. I think we need to, and I think perhaps, and I'll, I'll, throw, I'll throw down the gauntlet, Fred, just for the point of, <laughs> just to get a little something going on, uh, is that I think the suggestion that the payers were going to hand market share to biosimilars on a silver platter has in fact neutered that competition and neutered that opportunity for the biosimilars to actually gain market share. I think we have to revisit that. I think there's a better way to, go to, to get at that. And I think we all need to come to the table on it. And I think we need to come to the table on it in the context of, of patient outcomes. I think we need to start there. If we start with cost, we're never going to come to the right answer. We have to start with what is the best outcomes that we need to and want to achieve for our patients what does that look like? What, is, what have we achieved? And I think some great examples were presented. And then how do we get there in the most cost-effective way possible? And, and I know that our, our payers have demonstrated that they are very capable of bringing us to the table to achieve that cost-effectiveness, and they can do that in a healthy and balanced way. So I think it's important that we, we get back to first principles with respect to patients, that we have a Made in Canada solution, that it's a solution that creates a healthy and balanced marketplace for everybody that preserves patient and physician choice. I don't know why we would want to force patients to switch if we can achieve all of our other goals without doing that. One that continues to foster an environment of innovation. The importance of bringing new treatments to the marketplace, I think, will, will be something that we all uh, want to support going forward. I think we're going to need to do that through the generation of data. We need to understand what we're trying to accomplish here, and we need to understand what that looks like. And with the complexity of the patients, the complexity of the diseases, and the complexity of the patients that biologics treat, the only way we're going to understand this and make, and make positive uh, decisions that not only deal with the issues that we have today, but account for the challenges and the innovations that we're going to have in the future is by understanding what we're doing, what we're trying to do, and what that looks like in the patients that we're currently treating. And finally, I think if we do all of those things, we will arrive at a cost-effective and sustainable platform for biologics use going forward. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much. Thank you all very much, um, particularly for being so disciplined and mm -hmm. <laughs> sticking to time. So I'm kind of standing behind you, which is a bit rude as a panel, but I think if I stand in front of the loudspeakers, we do seem to get quite a lot of feedback problems, so forgive me for being behind you. Um, so now we can broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, 
So to some extent, we want to uh, you know, use the expertise of our panel, but we also want to use the expertise and um, ideas in, in the wider room. Um, I wonder if we could start this discussion, which we've, we've got a good 40 minutes for, so thanks to everyone. Um, Laura, putting you on the spot, <laughs> you've um, obviously thought about this issue for a number of years from quite a wide range of perspectives now. And, um, and everyone was listening with great interest to what you had to say. I wonder if you'd just like to spend like two or three, maybe max five minutes, um, just kind of giving us your thoughts on some of the issues that have been raised about the challenges of moving forward on, on, on these issues. I'm, I'm thinking about things that the points that have been made about the issue of equivalence of the product, the process, the model of care, that seems to be coming through consistently from all the therapeutic areas um, and is clearly something you've encountered um, uh, in, in, in Scotland. Um, and, and any other points that you want to comment on? I mean, one that I was struck by is, you know, is equivalence all right? I mean, you know, given the powering of the studies, you know, can we ever say to our patients or can clinicians ever say to their patients, you know, well, don't worry, this thing's equivalent when the study may mean that it's actually 30% less effective. Um, on the other hand, if the regulator has conducted studies and looked at the, at, at, at the molecule, well, not the molecule, but looked at the biological action and has determined that it is equivalent, then how do we factor that into the consideration? Um, so, I, I mean, just, I'm just trying to pick up some of the things that I think have come through the other presentations. Would you just like to spend two or three minutes kind of reflecting on those from how they've arisen in the Scottish situation and how you've made progress with them, I think, and then we'll, we'll broaden it out. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose I'm going to start with the easier one, I think. Oops, I think we've just, got just some. Keep, I, I'm, I'm off, just don't ah, right, okay. try and speak fairly close. Uh, yeah. Around the models of care. Um, I mean, I think we've probably given that a good airing in terms of agreeing that it's an issue that we need to really understand. Um, and I don't, know, I don't know what more I'm going to say different from what I've said already in terms of we, we have really got into the detail with the clinicians about what the barriers are to them making the changes in terms of their provision of care. And when I, when I said in my presentation, it's down to the product. It can often be down to the actual product. And I can't remember who it was that said, I think it was maybe Carter, that said um, the, the product and the model of care were key. And that, that really is the message that that's what we've learned. And so, you know, we're in, a, we're in a situation, to use the oncology example just now with rituximab, where it's licensed for a range of uh, indications, both in cancer and in other specialties, We've got a mixed bag in terms of the preparations that are available, subcut, IV rapid infusion, IV. We've got a complete mix within each board and across boards in terms of how it is used. And, and boards have structured their service around the product, if that makes sense. So they've made changes to how they deliver their services by using going to subcut or IV. And so the, the complications of introducing a biosimilar which is only available as an IV preparation that has to be given over four, four hours is quite astronomical. So we are looking at doing some high level, quick and dirty type of health economics analysis of that because it really might not be worth our while to make any changes there, even though there's a 30% reduction in the product cost. Because if you're looking at additional nurses, additional chair time, we don't have additional chair time. We don't have facilities that can just expand We've got a small room often that we're giving the chemotherapy in. So there are really, really practical considerations. All right, OK. Around Can you keep it close to your mouth? Uh, practical considerations around the actual model of care and, and the, and the um, service delivery. The infliximab etanercept is another good example where we have infliximab that's given through nurse-led clinics. So there was a really excellent opportunity for that patient clinician, we call doctors, nurses, pharmacists, clinicians, conversation about the change. And that was an easy conversation to have in the routine delivery of the service. Whereas a tannercept is provided by something we call home care. Patients get it delivered. 
to their home for administration. And so, and it's not NHS staff, NHS staff that do that. So it's a completely different model. So I think you have to really, really understand that. And it sounds like that message has, has been understood today. And I think that's a really good starting point. The equivalence one is tricky because I think we've obviously got some differences of opinions <laughs> around the table and we do defer to our regulator around that. So if our regulator are content, then that would be our starting position. Now that is not to say that we have not taken it seriously and I think we've demonstrated that prescribing confidence is a really important issue. In gastroenterology, the work that they've done through their national audit has not shown any differences in terms of outcome or safety concerns, but that does not mean to say that would be the same in other specialties. So, you know, I think you do have to keep focusing on your particular specialty area and, and potentially at one point, at some point, similarly as we've come along the, the road in two years, in five years, we might get some better homogeneity between the specialties, but at this present moment in time, I don't think we have that. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, any other quick comments from the panel? Um, you've each made sort of specific comments. Any other direct, short comments before we invite questions from the table, from the room more widely? Anyone want to come in? Frederick? Yeah. I'm going to give you the mic, by the Thank way. You. No, again, I think the uh, from a specialty to specialty standpoint, like there's obviously some variability that need to be uh, accounted for and considered. Um, that being said, like I, I think when when you look at the uh, base of evidence that exists, and it's uh, there's a lot of information on biosimilars, both in in a in a, an experimental setting as well as in a, an observational research setting, and I think uh, and also uh, what I was struck by is the anecdotal reports from certain physicians in Europe, mainly who um, you know were admittedly completely opposed to biosimilars at a time. And then um, years later come uh, to talk about their experience with biosimilars and say, I don't see a difference. It's, it's working really well. So I think when you combine these different elements, obviously you're talking about aggregate information. You don't, you don't necessarily go by individuals and there's, there's individual variability that is of uh, uh, interest as well. Uh, but when you look at it overall, like there is definitely areas where there is uh, obviously lots of space for utilization of those biosimilars. Uh, and I think, you know, even if we let alone that switching concept and we just talk about naive patients, like we're far in Canada from having been uh, making any progress really on the utilization of biosimilars in naive patients. Thanks very much. Carl, I think you want to come in. Yep. <clears throat> so this kind of comes back to the equivalence thing, and, and that really resonates, and I think probably for Don as well. When a patient's doing well, they don't want to stop doing well. And we participate in the original etanercept studies, and we also participate in the etanercept going from the lyophilized, you have to mix it up twice a week, to the pre-filled syringe. On average, they were equivalent. So the product was, has been marketed as, as, as 50 milligrams once a week, and it's not marketed as the 25 twice a week lyophilized, you have to mix it up, but it's still available. Now, to be clear, in that study, we probably had about 20 patients, and you know what? Some patients didn't do as well when they went to the, to the pre-filled syringe. And guess what? When they went back to the lyophilized, mix it up twice a week, they did better. So there is a significant variation. When you have a product uh, that is effective for an individual, for the patient, they really don't want to give that product up. And, and uh, in, the, in my understanding of the biosimilars uh, sphere is that though the, we have these ranges that are, are tighter than they were for generic small molecule products, um, the, the uh, biosimilars actually got closer to those ranges. Uh, they were tighter. Than, than what was allowed within the study. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, we do have our other examples, and uh, most clinicians do. Plaquenil is a medication that's been around for donkey's age. Uh, we use it for rheumatoid arthritis and for lupus, and it's, it's been very effective, and notwithstanding our, our, our dependence on methotrexate as a pre-biologic, uh, small molecule product, uh, we still have a significant proportion, at least I do, probably 25% of my patients do very well with a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis on, on Plaquenil. I usually initiate Plaquenil because our experience was in 2003 when the generic became available, 80% of people did very well, sounds like the generic kind of thing, and 10% couldn't tolerate, 10% lost benefit, and when they went back to the original product, they did very well. Thank you very much, Jack. 
And so you got an inexpensive product, at least in Canada, uh, that's very well tolerated, has minimal toxicity uh, generally compared to almost anything else. And if you start with a generic in that particular issue and the patient doesn't do well and it takes four months to work, imagine, four months to work. At the end of the four months, you gotta say, hmm, I wonder if you were one of those 10%. And if not, if you don't go through that exercise, now you got, you've given up on a product which might have been effective for a patient at low cost and low, low adversity. So we have to be always thinking of the patient and what they have in my practice, patients actually would pay for that product even if they were funded uh, uh, in Ontario as a uh, over 65, they would usually pay it. And then I would say at six months, we're going to change. We're gonna go on the generic and see how you do it and 80% of the time you'll be good. And that's good, everyone's fine. Because the outcome is the issue, not the product, it's the outcome. And, and then the, the few people that did have an adversity, we could always go back to the, to the uh, innovative product as it were. And that was always a very patient-centered program or approach that we had. Unfortunately, we don't really have that for what Thomas was speaking about. Sometimes if you, when you uh, present a person with a molecule, in the biologic sphere, then try and present the other nature, you might have problems. Now, the studies have suggested that you can go back and forth, forth and back, and it's not su such a problem. But uh, as Thomas uh, uh, demonstrated in his, uh, his study, the studies that he showed, that there is uh, some complications in the real world. Yep. Um, Laura, can I just go via Tom to you? Um, Tom, what, what, what would your kind of, what would you do if you were, make, if you were running the world, how would you, uh, how would you set it up? If I was running the world. Um, so I need to go firstly from the position that I think cost containment is important um, and that um, a survivable healthcare system that's delivered to the maximal number of people needs to concentrate on cost containment. Um, I think when it comes to these thoughts around how close is close enough and uh, positioning of what are you willing to tolerate, it's very situationally specific. It is very hard for me to argue about efficacy of a naive biosimilar if I'm happy to tell my patient that adalidumab and infliximab are the same. Um, and so to know that I have a biologically equivalent molecule, to argue that there's any nuance of difference for the, for the naive patient is sort of um, not very sincere. Um, the corollary also is that I'm working within an environment with multiple agents. And so I'd have the same approach. If this doesn't work because we rapidly uh, become sensitised, then I'll be more cautious with the second agent, etc. It's different if I'm sitting there thinking about changing and there is no universal response. Um, if I am a patient who is married with children, who is finally back in the workplace, who had 10 years off trying to get control, this is my third anti-TNF, uh, and now I've been there making money for six years and I'm great, I'm not willing to tolerate any margin of, of difference that's not 0.1% as a risk because I have nowhere else to go. I'm sitting there, I didn't have very bad disease, I got over it very nicely, it's my first anti-TNF, this is going to sort of make a, a reasonable, a huge contribution to my position in society helping to contain costs. Uh, you know, it's, an, it's a very easy discussion. Uh, and so the concept of switch is different from the concept of bringing forward. What I do like in Canada is the concept of having a free market economy. Uh, and what I find difficult with my colleagues in Europe is the idea of tendering and there being just one agent uh, because I don't think it's the molecule, I think it's the product. And so if you can come to market with equivalent comparable pricing and you can p put your product against the other product, which as a product may be very enticing and it just doesn't matter. It's all, it's all then down to commercialization as to what it is that I can offer you within my product that is going to work for you as a patient and as a physician um, is the ideal part. I think competition brings down price and now that we've established where this molecule is and we've spent a nice time getting used to using it, um, it's time for that to become more uh, containable in a cost perspective. Thanks very much. Um, 
Eric, maybe I can come to you next after Laura, um, who's waiting, but I think there's some issues there you might want to respond to. Um, Laura. That's okay. That's uh, fine. You can come back. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. Eric, do you, do you want to come in now for a minute or two? And I mean, in terms of whether there should be a kind of free market or whether we should use procurements to give exclusivity in effect to uh, one product or another through the, through the tendering procurement process. Okay, um, I guess for public plans, our main current mechanism is, is using uh, the PCPA mechanisms. And, and for that, we, we have not used tendering um, as a mechanism. Um, but we are informed by how we deal with uh, oral generics, where we have um, sort of set pricing tiers of, of when the first one comes in and then the second one. And, and obviously the dynamics, and everyone knows that the dynamics with oral generics are very different than what we're dealing with with um, um, biosimilars. At the same time, though, that there is some learnings from the oral generics and that the pricing that you're seeing is transparent pricing. And I think that um, one of our goals around um, biosimilars and biologics, uh, wherever possible, is, is to try to achieve transparent pricing so that everyone can see those pricing prices and both public and private can, can benefit from them. Um, so if we are trying to uh, ensure that the, um, I guess the playing field is level, I think that is one area where I think the innovator company does struggle with because of their implications of transparent pricing in Canada may have impacts in, in other markets outside of Canada. Um, but I think that in terms of um, how we are trying to approach this in general, I, I think it does require that overall system review. Um, and like I said earlier, I think we are, uh, um, I guess, finding out how much of our system is perhaps dependent on manufacturer-funded um, services that we weren't before, and I think that's something we definitely need to kind of look at and reassess, because I think that if it is a service that is, is benefiting patients, uh, how much of it should be sort of public, private, and, and manufacturer versus um, you know, uh, other health system funded. So I think those are important things to look at. Thanks very much, Eric. So questions? Um, or comments? They don't have to be questions to the panel. Um, anyone got um, issues? Yes, please, at the front. Well, uh, Diane Rosen from Calvin. Uh, more as a comment. That, um, Laura, the, the, when you talked about it's not just about managing the biosimilar, it's managing of the biologic. I think that we, you know, every disease is different, but it goes back further than that. I think it's management of the disease itself, and that Carter was pointing this out, so that there's opportunity in um, in a model of care, because when you talk about the treatment, the product, I really talk about the model of care versus the product itself. And so when we talk about a model of care and we look at methotrexate, methotrexate is not used perhaps appropriately by all rheumatologists in this country, nor are the patients actually taking it because they go to their pharmacy and they're told, oh, they're putting you on this chemotherapy and you know it's going to, you can't take with this, you can't break pregnant, you have to flush the toilet twice. You know, <laughs> who's going to take a medication like that? And so, you know, having a, having a model of care where you actually have support for those patients at the onset, I think is a real opportunity and perhaps saves when you look at um, going on, you know, saves people who go on to biologic, or people will be able to stay on longer or have better results because clearly the data shows that most of the medications we use with methotrexate is significantly better. So I think that the model of care has to roll back, not to the biologics, but roll back. And our outcomes have to be measured from that point, not from the start of an expensive medication. So that's one of the points. When we talk about the product, we have to dissect the product. So, you know, in the product that is available today, well, some of it's about reimbursement. So, you know, maybe that's something that we can actually come to some agreement about uh, how you do that in a more facilitated way than how we're doing it at the present time. Some of it's about reimbursement of, some of it's about the drug being provided for free so we can start it soon enough. Some of it's about the education and follow-up and adherence. So what are those important, or, or, or the infusion, so what are those really important pieces that are in that product that we need? What are the pieces that we don't need or that we can do differently? So I think those are all the discussions that we really need to have versus you're providing the whole of the product or you're not. What's the, who can deliver it, where and how do we work in partnership together to do all of that? Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Yep, okay. Can 
I just, can I come back on that point? I completely agree with what you're saying and what's flushed out of the work in the rheumatology perspective is exactly the point that you've made. So I didn't have a chance to present it today, but we've developed a improvement plan, a plan for rheumatology around the whole care of the patient. And we've been looking very carefully at the Swedish registry model. I don't know if you're familiar with that, which has the patient reported outcome measures kind of similar to what you were talking about, Carter. Um, and we've applied for funding to try and test that in Scotland. So I completely agree with what you're saying and your point about methotrexate effectiveness versus biologicals is absolutely the view of our clinical lead rheumatologist. Any other points? Yes. Thanks. Um, Sorry, can you, can you say who you are before you start? Yeah. Uh, sure. Uh, Louise Binder. I'm from Save Your Skin Foundation. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists. I think that um, my takeaway from all of what I've heard um, is that, if, uh, number one, uh, we have to look at each disease area discreetly and develop a sort of um, a along the continuum plan for that particular disease. Number two, uh, that we need to have all the stakeholders uh, at the table developing that armamentarium across the um, continuum. And um, f was that two? <laughs> Three, uh, that um, in oncology, which is the, the area that I work in, we have um, a profound opportunity to do that because biosimilars are just coming into our market now. Um, so we can A, learn from the others and what has ha and hasn't worked so well for them, respecting the comments that you made, Sandy, that uh, there will be differences in oncology that need to be taken into account. So my challenge to the room is, uh, is there an opportunity for a multi-stakeholder um, coming, meeting, coming together, committee, I hate committees, but that will, t that will look at the issue of biosimilars and originator biologics along the oncology continuum, because probably Scotland is not aware of the Byzantine um, kind of approach to, uh, to the way we get things from the uh, lab laboratory into people's mouths, but it's pretty um, complex. And I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for us to do it together instead of the way we always do things, which are these silos that don't recognize the next silo and the impact of what they're doing on that next silo and, and so on. Uh, even up to and including real world. So is there any appetite um, to do that, perhaps in the oncology space? Sandy, do you think, do you think that, would, that would play well with your colleagues? And uh, as a, oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I can speak mostly as a clinician, of course, but I think all of us are quite frustrated by the process you describe of how there's so many sequential steps. And with this onslaught of new biologics coming down the pipeline, immunotherapeutics, you know, that are really revolutionizing all of cancer care, it's only going to get worse. So I think we have a real need for that kind of process. Um, I think the quality of our processes and improving drugs and getting them is exceptional in Canada, but the speed and efficiency is abysmal. And somehow we have to fix that. There, keep on, there are all these new bodies popping out of nowhere, like shadow cabinets like in CAPCA now, in, in, in inserting their voice into things without any kind of, you know, n none of us even heard of who these people are before. So having some kind of structure where we can work together and have meaningful input in a transparent way. The new bodies don't have transparency. How do we raise our voices and get, we all want to save money. I mean, we heard about the product versus the price, you know, but I think we're so desperate just to get the dollars now that I think it's all about the cost, frankly. It's all about the silo for the pharma costs for the drug. And I don't think anyone really cares about the rest of the product in the cancer system. It's about what can we save for every penny. It'd be great in terms of giving back in Canada if some of those cost savings could be reinvested into innovative biologics to help our patients. That will be much appreciated, plus the other process improvements. But those kinds of discussions aren't happening. And I think they, they need to happen. Okay, yes. Um 
Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I would, I would build on that, and I agree with you, Louise. I think the lesson we've learned in the immunology, in the immunology space um, is that we do need to take that step back and assess what the best way forward is. I think um, decisions have been made in the immunology space uh, that, aren't, that aren't bearing out and that aren't working. Uh, and and I, you know, Eric even spoke to it. I mean, the, the, the request for transparent pricing with the, with the acknowledgement that the originator companies can't necessarily provide that transparent pricing because of a, a, a whole raft of global issues that bind our hands locally. And yet, as a result of that, and, and um, Dr. Sadev, you're talking about, about um, the cost savings as being so important, and yet, in having made that decision, the, the public payers have foregone tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars in savings as a result of that. So hundreds of millions of dollars that could be put, put back into innovative medications, into the oncology space, into the immunology space have been foregone because of a, I would say, a, an incorrect assumption or incorrect philosophy uh, around the need for transparency. And, and in fact, we need to create a better model for that. Um, we need to, uh, you know, um, Eric also mentioned that there was a lack of awareness around the importance of patient support programs. There are, again, hundreds of millions of dollars that are put into sp patient support programs across the whole industry from, from all members of industry uh, to ensure that patients get the medications that they need, that they are inherent, that they have that durability. Um, and, and if we don't understand how that works and the important role that that plays, then we're not making the appropriate decisions in terms of how we're moving forward in these spaces. Any other? Yes, there's a point here, please. Hi, it's Gail Otara. I'm with the Gastrointestinal Society. Uh, part of the concerns that our patient community has is that there are so few biologic agents that are available to IBD. And, um, you know, whereas in RA, there might be 10 or more biologic agents. And so our real concern is that we are treated differently by every therapeutic area, even between Crohn's and colitis within the inflammatory bowel disease community, so that we can really drill down and make it a patient-centric approach, uh, because uh, the patients have challenges in all these things. Many of those patients have gone and waited a long time. This might be the only agent that they can have. And for those individuals to be switched is really detrimental uh, for, a, for a lot of reasons. And so, you know, um, earlier what um, Thomas was saying was really resonating with me because obviously I, I deal more with the adult side of, of IBD, but it's intense. And so I, I'm really nervous of any kind of blanket policy that would be in place that we all have to come on board and get on the bandwagon. That said, I have no issue, because the physicians who counsel us have no issue with starting naive patients. So I, I think primarily it's the switch. We've seen problems even switching in small molecules in our GI population where there's issues. And so switching these complex molecules is really a challenge. So I really urge caution in any kind of blanket policy that will cover all disease areas. I think that chimes very nicely with, with other things that have been said. Yeah. So any other points on the floor? I'm going to ask each of the panelists to spend one minute um, just kind of with a take home and possibly a next steps kind of thought. But um, I'm aware we haven't had a lot of time for thoughts from the, from the floor. So any other comments? There don't have to be questions. Um, comments that people would like to throw in at this point? Yes, one hand up there. Thank you, uh, Denis de Blois, uh, University of Montreal, Faculty of Pharmacy. I think we're all here in this room today because uh, the need for cost containment meets the principle of precaution. Maybe 25 years from now, we'll have learned enough about uh, uh, biosimilars and biologicals in general to uh, be, feel, feel more confident um, about their use in specific areas and context dependent. Now, it, I um, gather that um, 15, plus or minus 15% of uh, confidence in defining um, equivalence or uh, similarity it really equates to 30% difference possibly between two drugs. So we're with with post-marketing surveillance, we could accumulate data 
to reduce that uncertainty. Is there a way to um, accelerate this? Um, is there a model that would be applicable to every disease, or is it necessarily context dependent, depending on the indications? Um, is there something we could do and fund to accelerate this uh, um, closing of the knowledge gap? Any very quick responses to that? It's a very clear question. <laughs> Any very quick responses before we begin to wind up? Yes, Carter. I'll just reiterate uh, what we said earlier <clears throat> and what Diane Mosher said as well, is that I think with uh, the availability of these very excellent medications for a, for a portion of our population comes a, 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 a mandate to, to monitor them. And, and that should be in, inherent in, in how we care for our patients. I think evidence-based uh, medicine uh, in the real world, clinical effectiveness and adversity has to be measured in the real world and in a s systematic approach. Um, the paper-based uh, chart, it wasn't, it wasn't possible, but I think now with EMRs they can be, and I think uh, that we can sa satisfy your demand uh, that, that we begin that process. Uh, that has to be seen as a priority. I think you don't necessarily have to do it at the beginning with every group, you have to find the willing. And uh, I think right now I'd like to pr pr propose that, that at this time the rheumatologists uh, are the willing group who have a defined illnesses, have defined medications, are seeing new medications available, are, are developing platforms that allow us to assess a, a clinical effectiveness in the real world in practice. Uh, we're, we're, we're developing it across the uh, provinces as well to uh, access the administrative databases to have a more robust, uh, a robust approach. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, not coincidental that we've also got access to, to the largest number of products. Uh, so f with that, I think, comes a responsibility, and I think uh, I'd like to suggest that the rheumatology community does take that uh, uh, responsibly and uh, looks to the support of the system at all, as a whole. I'm talking about the healthcare system, where, where we, where, wherein we develop uh, uh, positive outcomes, uh, based on models of care that Diane and I both support and my, our, our members support, that that can be supported effectively by the healthcare system instead of hitting ourselves uh, across the, uh, hitting our head against the wall in a system uh, that recognizes the value but, but doesn't value it. Yes. Cool. Um, and I think the, the, uh, the important word there, Carter, is uh, systems change. We need to have a system which embraces this. At the moment, the, the very question you're asking is classed as research, which means everyone must be consented. For in paediatrics, it means they must be Health, Health Canada monitored and the costs associated with that for what is purely observational design um, are complete barriers to this ever happening. I mean, there has to be a broad-based systems approach within our universal healthcare system that real-life data and clinical effectiveness is just out for business. This is just normal day business. This is not something special that we do in our spare time. Very, uh, very interesting point. Thanks. Uh, sorry, the lady with the, from the Cancer Foundation, I think. Th yes. Thanks. A, a, a quickie, please. You're, yeah. You obviously yeah. don't know me if you're calling me a lady. Um, uh, I'm all about what you're talking about. I mean, I mean, this whole conference says it's about real world evidence as well as theory. Um, and I'm, but I'm a little bit worried about the suggestions that are being made that like, let's just go with the willing and all that stuff. And the reason I say that is because it seems to be the Canadian way that we kind of back into everything without having done the analysis at the front so that we don't end up with garbage in and garbage out. And we don't even have an agreement amongst, I don't even think, one stakeholder group about what real world evidence actually means, what it should capture, what it needs to capture to be, to be scientifically acceptable by our um, many agencies. Good point. So how do we, how so, do we make so I just want to respond that what we're talking about, what I'm referring to, is the current presence of of the same kind of systems you're talking about. These are uh, uh, peer review granting uh, research projects that are receiving external funding as well. 
uh, using physicians who have agreed to participate. So if, you, if one waits for everyone to agree to do something, you'll never get anywhere. And, and what you're looking for, I believe, is beacon sites type, of, type approach, uh, where you uh, then assess it. And by having EMRs that are, that are accessible for these purposes of research, then you can look to see what the generalizability are. So there are models, I think, that are appropriate. And, and it's that fashion that's going to be uh, going to give us a, an advantage. Uh, so I do disagree with you that, that there is nothing that allows us to move forward, uh, because these projects uh, are going forward, are producing uh, 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 manuscripts that are peer-reviewed and are shown to be effective. Uh, so I think there is, there is opportunity there for us. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's a tension, isn't there, between massive methodological issues and questions remaining to be resolved in real-world evidence, design and the like, but also there are simple approaches which can cut through that and make progress. And for example, in Europe, in, in Italy, most drugs are approved by the payer on condition of outcomes monitoring and review at two or three or four years on the basis of real-world outcomes. It's limited, it's imperfect, but it's, it's a step in that direction. So I think there's a, there's a tension there, if I offer a comment. I'm aware that we're moving towards um, our tea break. Um, but before we do that, I would really like to, we got such a brilliant set of people on the panel and they've given us a lot of thoughts already. Could I ask you each, and I'm going to kind of go the other way down you this time, finishing with you, Laura. Uh, <laughs> could I ask you each to literally one minute absolute max, 30 seconds preferable, um, final thoughts, a final point, issues that could actually be used to make progress on this um, and cut through some of this and go ahead. Okay, 30 thanks, seconds, Chris. Starting now. 30 seconds starting now. Okay, I, I think we're all here today and we're having this conversation and it's a complicated conversation because what we have isn't working. And I think to Louise's point, we could step back, reassess based on what we've learned so far, figure out what a better way to move forward is and we do that collaboratively. I think everybody is quite prepared to come to the table to work together to solve this problem, and I do think that all of that is very much rooted in evidence generation, and we need a robust and rig um, rigorous uh, data collection and evidence generation platform on which to make better decisions moving forward. Perfect. <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, so I, I'll go back to my anchor, which is coexistence of both biosimilars and uh, and, bio, and original biologics together in the marketplace. Um, I think I think I heard the word choice. I heard I heard, I heard the word competition is good, um, and I would venture to say that uh, currently, uh, as we have our system, uh, we we don't have a, a a place where we favor choice and competition in a way that's valuable to make that coexistence possible. And uh, you know, I also disagree with tender process. And you know, winners winner take all is not a, a policy that is uh, necessarily sustainable in, in in such areas as biosimilars. However, originator keeps all is not either sustainable from my perspective. Thanks very much, Dawn. You have a minute because we haven't had enough from patients. Oh, all right. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I'd like to echo what Louise and Gail said, that I, I don't want to see a blanket policy. All patients, all diseases are different. And that doesn't mean this has to blow up into a big, complex process. There are some guiding principles amongst things that I think will shake out to be the same. But there are some areas where there are real differences, and I'd like to make sure that that's taken into consideration. Again, to Louise's point about real-world evidence, there are some opportunities like those that Carter was talking about that can be leveraged. There are long observational cohorts that can be leveraged, and we can start collecting different information. I can't speak to all disease areas, but again, instead of recreate the wheel, what do we have that we can, you know, that we can leverage right now? I think that's really important. Um, Again, just to echo, you know, I think all stakeholders need to be part of this. I've been part of a couple meetings in the past month where there's been some different stakeholders, so I think everybody needs to be in the same room so that they can understand where the others are coming from. Lastly, you know, as patients, we're not immune to the fact that we cost the system and that these costs are becoming out of control. So, you know, I think Laura made a comment about sometimes patients can be more pragmatic. We're not standing there demanding the most expensive medications all the time. 
But do do just take into account the emotionally chargedness of the, those conversations, especially when people are pointed to to make a switch, for example, because of only economic purposes. Just put yourself in those shoes and think about what that means. Think about, you know, a lot of people go back to the worst place they've ever been in their disease. And quite honestly, in rheumatology, that's in a hospital ward for months at a time. And imagine having children at home and not being able to participate in life because that that's where people go. Unfortunately, that's, that's what the case is. So... I know there's tough decisions at stake here, and I'm not saying I live in a fantasy utopia where money grows on trees, I wish, but just really keep that in mind, that there's some delicate things here to consider. Thanks, Don. Eric. Great. Um, so I'd like to reiterate that I think biosimilars represent a tremendous opportunity uh, to really do more with the same. Um, but how do we get there? I think is re the real challenge, and I think we do need to do a better job at um, talking about the the value of of these dollars. Every day we hear about issues with our healthcare system. Uh, this is an opportunity, and I think it does it does require some effort on some um, on everyone's part. Um, but we do need to really talk about well, how is it going to really benefit us as a patient, uh, as as uh, clinicians, and how do we do it uh, in a in a reasonable way? And we don't want to wait uh, 20 years to to see this happen, but we'd like to do it now. Yeah. And uh, in the words of health economist friends, of, I think we're saying there's an opportunity cost. There may be an opportunity cost in switching. There may be an opportunity cost in not switching. And for the healthcare system, some somehow one has to try and balance that. But, how is the big question. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's easier to get too skeptical and maybe too negative in our discussions too about you know this new thing happening. I think we have to remember this is an opportunity. We need the cost savings. We're excited to see them coming down with the biosimilars. Uh, we have to remember that if we want perfect equivalent studies with tight margins, that's going to be much more expensive to do. A lot more patients. The perfect pharmacovigilance is very expensive. We don't do that for generic tablets. We need something as a hybrid model that suits our needs but may not be perfect. I think if we have drugs that have identical PK, identical PD, response rates in six months or two years that are identical in well-designed well studies, we will feel comfortable in oncology adapting with these drugs and just to maybe have a positive note on that. I think we also have structures already existing we can tap into to do uh, real-world monitoring. Uh, British Columbia Cancer Agency has a ro very robust registry they mine all the time for publications on long-term outcomes, you know, before and after a new drug is implemented. In Cancer Care Ontario, whenever we order every dose, it launches a connection to the funder's uh, website, the CCO, and that could easily be tapped into after every six months or so to say, what's the best response, what's happening with your patient, a few clicks and you're done. So we have to do that in a way that's also cost efficient and doesn't jack up the cost of the whole process. I think our, our prog progress over the future should not be driven by anecdotes of, uh, of those things that we recall as bad, bad outcomes. Uh, it should be driven by real world experience uh, collected in, in a acceptable fashion uh, through a, a standardized method, uh, as unintrusive as possible to be as inclusive as possible. And uh, I think that should begin at the, be at the diagnosis so that we really learn how a product uh, where it fits in the armamentarium uh, not at any particular point in armamentarium, but through the through the whole life cycle of that illness, especially in chronic disease, and that should be our, our ask and our demand. Thank you. So um, I'll take my opportunity to rule the world again. Um, and so, if I were to rule the world, I would have a a situation where, at a community level for the surrogate payer, we have decided at a uh, unit price per patient per day what we are able to pay for a certain agent. Um, and that is that is what is recompensed. Um, and whoever wants to come to that market to provide that product um, is there in a competitive market. I think in GI, with two anti-TNF agents, we've had a beautiful example of how a competitive market benefits everyone. 
by having two agents, we've led to the point where we have all of these services and, and more importantly, all of this information because by demonstrating what you could do was a way of influencing how you made your choice. Uh, and that is one way of creating an environment where all of the monitoring could well be possible. That your proof that, you're, that you are as good or better um, comes from the factors in the figures and you, you, we create systems. I think truly as a community we have to be better at having a system where those numbers can be and uh, Canadian physicians are nicely academic as a group. We are usually good at counting and measuring. We're more into that than other countries where I have worked. Um, and I think we should capitalise on that and move it forward with our universal healthcare paying system. Great. Laura, you started all this. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to finish? Yeah, okay. So maybe just, a, 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 it's been really interesting um, to hear the conversation and the similarities and the differences. And so it would maybe just be to, to remind you of some of the top messages from, from Scotland. It is a rapidly evolving area, and we have come a long way in our thinking in two years' time uh, since we started in 2015 to now. We've got much greater prescriber confidence and patient confidence from the experience that we've had, and that has undoubtedly been helped by the gain-share approach that we've taken and addressing quality issues in the service delivery. So I think that has to be part of the thinking. I would encourage you to take an incremental approach, start somewhere. Um, we've heard a lot about disease-specific approach, and I think that is the right way to do it. Um, and uh, it's sometimes a, talk, a, a conversation about a biosimilar. So in cancer, the conversation very much is, is do we use a biosimilar versus the originator biological as part of a whole regimen of care? In gastroenterology, it's been about good use of biological medicines. And in rheumatology, as we touched on earlier, it has definitely got us into the conversation about taking a step back and good management of the disease. So it's different for each area. We did push on an open door. So we started with two medicines that were used in a number of specialties, but we started with gastro and rheumatology because they were willing to have the conversation. We didn't start with the specialties that were much further behind in their thinking. Um, and what we are now starting to see is emerging, I think, is peer pressure between the specialties, which is interesting to observe. And so I don't think it's 25 years for change. I think you'll see it much more rapidly once you start the journey. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you. I think we should show our thanks to all of the panel. Um,